we find that he was a man of compassion. You've probably heard before, so I'm not going to belabor it, but just so that we're on the same page, the word that is used in our New Testament for compassion means this, this ache, this pain deep in the gut. Even more than a stomach ache, if you will. It's, it's when you see the suffering of others and it turns your stomach. You actually hurt for them. Viscerally, physically, you ache for them. The words that Rhonda read for us, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, a simple verse that is absolutely jam-packed with truth. Seeing the people, the word there is actually the crowds, just the masses. He, Jesus, felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. If you back up one verse, let's read verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages. Here he is, this itinerant preacher just traveling across the landscape. And what was he doing? He was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And when he saw them, he felt compassion for them. I want to highlight four things, and then I want to look at a few other texts where Jesus' compassion rises to the fore. The first thing that I see in verse 36 is this. Jesus saw the people. He saw them. Not just in passing, you know, you could go to a Riverman's game, you could go to a Chief's game, you could go to your grandson's or granddaughter's choir concert at school, and you would maybe notice a mass of people who were gathered. It's not just that Jesus saw, oh look, there's people here, but he saw them. He took notice, if you will, of each and every individual. There were no invisible people in Jesus' presence. I don't know about you, but I can become busy and I can rush through life and the people around me become a blur. Do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes as a parent, and, and my heart aches for this now that my kids are all grown, I look back on the mistakes I made as a dad. Boy, they're, they're hard. But sometimes when a child simply wants dad's or mom's attention, but we're busy, and we kind of push them to the wayside, did we even see them? <laughs> Jesus never pushed anyone to the wayside. Do you feel invisible sometimes? I want you to be mindful that when Jesus sees the crowd, when Jesus looks upon us gathered here this morning to worship Him, He sees you. And He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the troubles in your mind. He knows the hurts in your heart. He knows the scars upon your soul. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he, he sees you. And He knows you by name. And that should not be a troubling thing. That is a comforting thing. Because the second thing in the text is He felt compassion for them. Notice the first little word, felt. That's why I started with the stomach ache story. Compassion is something that we feel. Remember the Greek word that's used in the Gospels talks about an, an ache, a churning in the gut. Kicked in the stomach over the plight of others. Jesus felt compassion for them.
Is your life tainted with sin? Jesus came to bring forgiveness of that. Not judgment. Is your life troubled by hardship, be it economic or medical or relational or academic or whatever? Jesus feels for you. I've never been fond of listening to a politician say, I feel your pain. Because all I hear is, well, <laughs> I don't like hearing a politician say, I feel your pain. Because in all honesty, I really doubt that they do. I'm skeptical. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm skeptical. Jesus, however, in absolute truth, feels your pain. Absolute truth. No lie, no deceit, no smoke and mirrors. He felt compassion for them, empathy, sympathy, and a desire to bring mercy. His heart went out to them, he felt their suffering, and he sought to bring a cure. He sought to bring a cure. And so that verse 35 that we read, he first of all proclaimed the gospel. He spoke good news. That he had come to liberate the captive. That he had come to bring new life, a reconciliation with God. That he had brought, come to touch their lives in their day-to-day -day experience and living. And he even healed their diseases and sicknesses. Sometimes I wish I could do that. <laughs> I'd make a trip down to OSF and empty all the hallways, but I can't do that. I want you to be mindful that Jesus feels for you. When you feel that you're alone, he feels that. And he is there. What were their, what, excuse me, what was their situation, though? He, he says, Matthew does, that the people were two things. The first, he says, distressed. Distressed. Someone once told me that stress spelled backward is dessert, so the best cure for your, your frustration is go eat a cake or a pie. A amen? I'm getting some amens on that one. Says they were distressed. The, the word can also be translated harassed. Harassed. Does life ever harass you? You ever feel like you're on the short end of the bully stick? <laughs> That's what Jesus saw in these people. Now, it, now think back to the audience that he was dealing with. They were politically harassed. Remember? Israel was not a free nation. They were occupied by the mighty Roman Empire. Everywhere they turned, there were soldiers of the Roman Legion who were not kind. Taxes? I complain about taxes. What I pay is nothing compared to the burden that they were under. keeping them utterly dependent upon the Roman Empire, keeping them bound up in extreme poverty, taking everything that they worked so hard for. They were harassed by Rome. They were harassed by religious leaders. If you think Jesus was the only one who had issues with the Pharisees, those who were spiritually upright. We've got our religious stuff together. We understand the law and we obey it. And you, you keep your distance from us because you're just not really good people. And so even those who should be leading them closer to God were actually becoming a barrier 
that kept them from God. Life was hard. Maybe you feel harassed. Maybe you feel like you're on the short end of the bully stick sometimes. But the second word that is used here in the chapter 9, verse 36 is dispirited. That's not a word I use often. It's, it's just there in my New American Standard translation. Dispirited. Broken spirit. Discouraged. Defeated. Frustrated. Beaten down. The word could also be translated thrown down. Notice that that's something that's done to you. Something external to you throws you down. Dispirited. It's a lot of sadness in our world, isn't there? It's a lot of gloom, a lot of burden, a lot of heartache. A lot of hatred, a lot of anger. Jesus looked at the crowd. And he didn't just see a mass, but he saw the people. Each and every one. He looks at the world today. He looks at you and I and he sees people. He sees us. And his heart goes out to us. His stomach churns for us as he feels compassion for the plight of of being harassed and thrown down. And then that agricultural image that the Bible uses so often, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep need a caregiver. Without a shepherd, sheep are susceptible to disease, they're susceptible to predators, the coyotes, the wolves. They are susceptible to injury as they plummet into a ditch or break a leg in a hole in the ground. And Jesus looked at him and thought, there are so many dangers that surround them. And they're like sheep that are just wandering aimlessly, looking for that green pasture, looking for those quiet waters but they don't have a shepherd to lead them. Aren't we fortunate that we have one that is known as the Good Shepherd? Aren't we fortunate that there is one who leads us beside still waters and into green pastures? It's Jesus. He is full of compassion. His compassion meter never dips off of full. <laughs> he pours it out upon us and pours it out upon us and pours it out upon us and it never runs dry. Matter of fact, we see him with this word compassion a number of times in the Gospels. Now, what I've done just in my study is I've removed the repetition stories, okay? Uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000, I'm going to tell it to you once. I don't need to tell it to you three times, okay? But it occurs oft times in the Gospels. The, the, the first story is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. The, what, what, what we read is, when he went ashore... You see, he and his buddies had just traversed the Sea of Galilee in their boat. He saw a large crowd. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> he saw them. Not just a mass of people, but he saw people, individuals, and felt compassion for them. Well, that sounds familiar. Felt. There's that emotional, that visceral, that physical aspect of compassion. His stomach hurt, his heart went out to them, and he healed their sick. This story, if you go on to read, is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. 
That's a pretty big crowd that he stumbled upon, isn't it? That's a huge crowd that he stumbled upon. And he had time for them. He didn't look at the elderly and say, eh, enough. You've lived your lives. No, he touched them and ministered to them. He didn't look at the little ones and say, hey, don't be an irritant. <laughs> Children should be seen and not heard. He would pick them up and hold them in his hands and tussle their hair and bless them. <laughs> Let the little children come unto me. He didn't look at the day laborer whose fingernails were caked with grease or dirt and say, you don't have much to bring. He cared for them. He didn't look at the IRS agent and say, you're in league with Rome, go away. Matter of fact, he included one of those fellows in his band of 12, didn't he? Remember Matthew, the tax collector? I just wrote my quarterly tax check. Never a fun thing to do. But Jesus reached out to those who worked for the Roman IRS. Matter of fact, that's one of the things that made the religious leaders mad, was Jesus was often found with who? Tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> he saw them. They were in this crowd of 5,000. And Jesus cared for them. And the next story is just one chapter over. It's in chapter 15, verse 32. It's a similar story. It's interesting to me that Jesus not only fed the 5,000 one day, but sometime after that, he feeds 4,000. And this is the story in Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. It's the, the crowd of 4,000 and his feeding of them. And we read, Jesus called his disciples to him, and he said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want them, I, I do not want to send them away hungry. They might faint on the way. And of course the conversation unfolds, well how are we going to do that? We don't have much food. Jesus takes what little there is and miraculously multiplies it and cares for them. He felt compassion for the people. Fed 5,000, fed 4,000, healed their sick, preached the gospel of the kingdom. But that's not all of it. In Matthew chapter 20, the story's in verses 29 through the end of the chapter, but in verse 34, we read the compassion statement. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. If you read the story, Jesus and his merry band are walking through the city of Jericho and there are two blind men there. They hear the rustle of the crowd. They hear the cries of the people. They've probably heard about this Jesus before and when they hear that name, they cry out, they cry out, have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. You ever cried out, Lord, have mercy? Have mercy on us. And I love how Jesus engages them. He, he simply comes and says, what do you want me to do? We want to see. And he was moved. It doesn't use the word feel there, does it? He was moved with compassion. His actions, his decisions, motivated by his gut-wrenching compassion for these two blind men. And he touches their eyes and they regain their sight. And what's the proper response when Jesus is ministered to you in your need? They followed him. They followed him. 
Jesus is full of compassion. I, I think it's interesting. There's, a, there's another healing story. There, 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 there's a man who lays at the pool of Bethesda, and he's been there for a long, 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 long time. There, there was a, a fictional story that the, an angel would stir the waters, and if you could get in the waters, you'd be healed. And people who were absolutely desperate would gather at that pool waiting for the stirring of the waters. And one day Jesus comes across this man. You've probably read the story, but Jesus asked him a very pointed question. Do you want to be healed? You'd almost think that was a duh. But the man didn't respond with a yes. The man says, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. I can't get there. So I just lay here in my despair. Do you want to be healed? Ultimately, of course, it transpires that he does, and Jesus heals the man, and he picks up his mat, which causes a whole other issue because it was the Sabbath, and he's carrying his knapsack, and the religious people get their noses bent out of shape over all kinds of things. I throw that story in there because... I'm not going to ask it, but I wonder if Jesus would ask us in the midst of our despair, do you want to be healed? Or do you really like living in your suffering? And think about it. There are some people who aren't happy unless they're miserable. That just, you've, you've, surely you've come across people like that, have you not? They're not happy unless they're miserable. Do you want to be healed? No. If you heal me, I might have to be happy. And then I would be miserable. Go away, Jesus. And he will honor that. But I think those are few and far between. I think most of us appreciate the touch of God upon our lives because he's had compassion on me and he's had compassion on you. Ah, oh, man, may we be a people who simply cry out, have mercy on us. And then there's one more. We have to turn to Mark for this one. And it's actually one of my favorite stories. So you've heard it, oh, a dozen times over the last five years. It's in Mark chapter 1. It's the story of the leper whom Jesus heals. And I've just been reading the compassion verse, but I, I want to read a little bit more of this story to you. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. A leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, falling on his knees before him, and saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion... Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And Jesus sternly warned him, immediately sending him away, he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. But he stayed out in unpopulated areas and they were coming to him from everywhere. There's so much there. There's almost a whole other sermon, but I won't do that to you this morning. Notice again that Jesus is moved with compassion. This leper and we have to understand, would have been an outcast in society. He's not just harassed and thrown down, but he is ostracized. He is he's segregated from the rest of the culture. The lepers could only gather with other lepers in leper colonies. If anyone were to be seen coming near them, they had to cry out their disease, unclean, unclean, I'm a leper, don't come near me had not known compassion 
for who knows how many years. Even his approach to Jesus, do you hear it? If you're willing. He wasn't even sure if this Jesus would care enough to heal him. If you're I know you can. If you're willing, you can cleanse me. But are you willing? And I do want to make a big deal of this. The first thing Jesus did was he reached out and touched him. What a no-no. <laughs> uh-uh. In that culture, Jesus is now unclean. He touched a leper. But what did the man need? Yes, he needed the physical healing of his body, but he needed someone to care. And that simple touch. He said, of course I'm willing. You silly fellow. That's why I came. To touch the lives of men and women. Jesus touched him. And said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy leaves and he's cleansed. Can you imagine? He's excited. He wants to tell everybody. And Jesus says, shh. <laughs> Can you imagine? Don't tell anybody. Go to the priest. Go through the religious ceremony. The priest is going to check you out. Make sure that all the spots and the disease is gone. But the man cannot keep his mouth shut. Could you? Don't be too hard on him. If that, if that was you, could you keep your mouth shut? Probably not. And here's the end result, though, that Jesus was trying to avoid Word of that spread so much that he couldn't even go back into town. He had to pitch his tent out in unpopulated areas. <laughs> but even then, the crowds flocked to him. Because here was the Son of God, the Son of Man, who brought compassion to the people. I think I want to give you two thoughts as we conclude this morning. The first is this. This, this sermon series, which is probably a 10-year sermon series, is all eyes on Jesus. I want us to focus on Him. Who is this Jesus? He is the one who is full of compassion for you. Does your heart hurt? Is your mind troubled? Is your soul scarred? He cares for you. You are not an invisible individual on the face of this planet with billions of folk. He sees you. Do you know that? Do you understand that? He came for you. I want you to leave this morning knowing that you are, or at least can be, the recipient of a divine compassion. Because when Jesus sees the people, he feels compassion. And he preaches to us the gospel of the kingdom of his eternal reign, the forgiveness of our sin. And he even touches us in the realities of our daily living. Giving sight to the blind, healing to the leper, cleansing of disease. He cares. The second thing that I would like to send you out with is this. If we're going to be disciples of Jesus, and the idea of being a disciple is to become like Jesus, we ought to be compassionate people. Meaning, one, we need to open our eyes to the crowds. To quit just seeing a mass of people, but to see the individuals. To know that they have names. That they have aspirations, that they have hurts. See the people. And if you feel compassion, touch them. Now, you may not be able to give them sight or heal their leprosy. Maybe you can. I don't know. I can't. But you can touch their lives. You can. Touch them. And bring the divine compassion of God to others as you yourself have received. We're going to sing.
If you don't know this Jesus who's full of compassion, he simply invites you. He says, come and follow me. Come follow me. That's his invitation. And he gives us life. If you want to come and follow Jesus, we invite you to, to make a public confession of that as we sing this morning. Would you stand? to join us today both in person and online um, it looks like the Sun is actually shining outside so woohoo to that um, so I hope that you have a blessed week and let's see